in the spatial networks. So I would suggest you to be extremely careful in doing this operation. And I actually can tell you that we changed the way that we do surgery because of this. Other operations like subcutaneous hematoma, again, related with gas, with bleeding. Intra-abdominal abscess, probably a hiding bleeding that eventually became an intra-abdominal abscess. And also a macro, macros diverticulum. That was the cause of death of this patient. There was a dehiscence of a macros diverticulum. In terms of hospital readmissions and reoperations, 4.4% uh, of the patients were readmitted. Again, as you can see, most of the readmissions were clinically managed, and 1.7% of the patients were managed with reoperations. As you might uh, think about that, gastric leak, all the patients had to be reoperated, intra-abdominal abscess, intra-abdominal bleeding in one case. These two patients were reoperated just following the primary operation, these two ones. And in clinically managed, we have ileus and a specific abdominal pain, acute renal failure, two patients, vomiting, two patients, Pneumonia in one patient and trocar site infection in one patient. In relation to late mortality, we also addressed this problem. This is another paper of 202 patients that had a midterm outcome of the laparoscopic uh, immune interposition. The mean follow up, as you can see, is 39 months, ranging from over two years to six years of post op period. So as you can see, late mortality were mainly related, uh, one, for a clinical disease and one from intestinal obstruction. Again, as you can see, the clinical status of this patient is again important, not only in terms of early morbidity and mortality, but also in terms of late morbidity and mortality. In terms of uh, complications, late complications, we had one idiot, one patient with uh, severe vomiting, one abdominal wall infection later on, later on in the post-operative period, one intra-abdominal bleeding again, two intestinal obstruction. We also fear about intestinal obstruction. We used to say that, okay, we are doing three enteroanastomosis. <coughs> three enteroanastomosis, probably we will be getting a high risk of complications. And so we could see that that is not true. And so we can perform these three anthranastomals relatively safe and without further complications. As you can see, this instance of 1.5 postoperative intestinal obstruction is, is something that is comfortable on my point of view. The second issue has to do with efficacy. There are several ways of uh, dealing with efficacy. The very first publication that we had in the year 2007 has to do with 39 patients uh, submitted to the laparoscopic area of interposition and uh, had a mean follow-up of 7 months ranging 4 to 16 months. 86% of the patients were able to achieve A1C below 7 without medication. We then published this in the SORT journal, a prospective randomized control trial comparing two version, the two versions of laparoscopic ileum interposition associated with sleep extracting for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. As Dr. Sudan mentioned, this, this work was, was audited by an independent reviewer, an uh, independent company from the United States, and the mean follow-up was 25.6 months, ranging 24 to 28. Again, we were able to achieve 91% of control, meaning A1C below 7 without medication. Both operations were effective in relation to the preoperative status of type 2 diabetes. But as you can see, the diverted version was more effective 
than the extended version, not only in terms of remission, meaning A1C below 6, but also in terms of the patients uh, with achieving A1C below 7. So it was very clear for us that by using a prospective randomized control trial, that the diverted version was more effective than the standard version. The next issue that we thought it would be important relies on the sustainability of effect. As you can see, this is part of this work that is still being revised in at the Journal of American College of Surgeons. Uh, there is a quite a stable performance here of the operation in relation to A1C. Uh, this is another work that was published in Diabetology a year 2009 and where we deal with the mechanisms of in diabetes improvement following the operation. Specifically on, the page, on this paper we addressed several different items and one of them was a clear evidence of a weight independent effect of the operation. As you can see, this is not correct, this is not lean, this is normal weight. No matter if the patient was normal weight, overweight in green, or patients with uh, obesity grade 1 in between 30 and 35, their postoperative result was the same. So that means that weight is not as relevant as we would like to. And that, is, that means that 82% of the patient achieved optimal glycemic control considered as A1C below 6.5 without anti-diabetic medication with no clear correlation with preoperative BMI. This is a sorry, this is a really busy slide that I would like to address uh, carefully with you. This is also part of this paper that is being now revised at the JAX. Again, 202 patients, mean follow-up of 39 months, ranging 26 to 72. As you can see here in this paper, no matter what is the weight, the ability of the operation to achieve A1C below 6 was nearly the same. Not surprisingly, the performance in relation to fasting plasma glucose and postprandial plasma glucose was different. Here, as you can see, 50% of the patients got a fasting plasma glucose below 100. And almost 76% of the patients got postprandial plasma glucose that was considered to be normal. So there is a, as one might expect, a better performance of the operation in relation to postprandial glycemia when considering uh, fasting plasma gl gl uh, glucose. Again, as you can see here, uh, there are also subgroup analysis of patients with A1C below 6, but still with uh, uh, fasting plasma glucose of below 6. Patients with A1C below 6.5 and fasting plasma glucose in between 100 and 126. As you can see, the picture is, a, is different when you have plasma glucose in between 100 and 126. The majority of the patients are still having overweight or obese patients. Altogether, what we are facing in this picture is that we've, we've been able to achieve 80 more over 80 of the patients with A1C below 6.5 and nearly 90% of the patients in the long run still having uh, A1C below 7 without any diabetic medication. This is the typical picture of our patients. Preoperative fasting plasma glucose of over 200 coming to almost close to 100. Not a surprise when we recognize that the achievement of control of postprandial glucose was an early achievement, as early as a month. And that has to do with the increasing 
The credence has to do with either deposition, and as you might expect, is it is as soon as one month. This is different in relation to the fasting plasma glucose, and that is why I mentioned to you early in the morning that endogenous glucose production is really an issue for us, and this is, has to do with the fasting plasma glucose. Despite this achievement with postprandial glucose, the type of curve that we've been seeing with the fasting glucose is like this. So there is not a sharp decrease as the postprandial glucose. The same in relation to the fasting insulin, again, a sharp decrease as early as one month and a stable picture throughout the years. In relation to C-peptide, there is a decrease at one month, but then a, a, a more important decrease at the 12 or the 12 months and 24 months of pause uh, follow-up. Tomorrow we will discuss the difference in between the performance of the fast insulin and the performance of the fast and C peptide. In terms of the glycemic control, this is another paper of, uh, from us of Pugin the Diabetes. This is a typical CGMS uh, uh, that will be seen pre op. Patient with using insulin and two other oral agents. And this is a classical picture of the CGMS despite the fact of using first line drugs. And this is the typical post operative picture that we have been seeing with the inhibitor position. As you can see, there is a homogeneous performance throughout three to five years of CGMS evaluation. There is also a sharp decrease on the mean amplitude of glucose excursions. Tomorrow we will discuss again the performance of the glucose excursion and how important it is to the overall results that we are getting. Still in terms of an efficacy glycemic control, this is the typical picture that we've been seeing post-op. In red, or in, sorry, in blue preoperative, and in red postoperative. There is an early absorption of glucose that has to do with the interposition. And this is of utmost importance because we used to say, or people used to say, okay, what is going to happen when this ileal interposition jejunalizes? What about the intraendocrine cells? What about the absorptive cells? So we used to say that, okay, this is something that we really need and something that we really want as soon as possible. And this is the main explanation. So the sooner the gastro or the ileal jejunalize, the better. It is amazing how this effect is decreases as time goes by. And this is the performance of insulin. What a surprise. Uh, so there is a sharp decrease of the fast insulin, and the insulin response was immediately and adequately according to the prevailing glucose excursions. So as you can see, there is a sharp increase of insulin that, it, that was uh, in correlation of the sharp increase of glucose absorption. And the same for C-peptide. So as you can see, the pancreas is being stimulated probably by GLP-1 and has to do with the increase of both C-peptide and insulin. And even more important is the performance of insulin secretion in relation to the prevailing glucose concentration. This has to do with beta cell glucose sensitivity. This was published last year in Diabetology and clearly shows that insulin secretion correlates with the prevailing glucose concentration and there is a response in relation to that prevailing glucose excretion.
In terms of beta cell glucose sensitivity, which 